When I'm making sounds for a MIDI polyphonic expression, my favorite technique, my go-to bread and butter method, is the wavetable. Wavetables are very powerful and very versatile, and nine times out of ten, they're going to give me exactly the sound that I want. Now, a cursory survey of videos about wavetables on YouTube indicates that everybody is doing it wrong. And what I mean by that is really that there's an important thing that gets overlooked about them, which is that the waves of which these tables are composed can be literally any conceivable harmonic wave. And I think the reason this gets overlooked is a lot of our ideas about wavetables formed at a time when this wasn't really possible. So back in 1978, when the PPG wave came out, you couldn't just make your own wavetable. That was a very specialized task. You needed scientists in lab coats using million dollar computers as the size of your house to make your wavetables for you. So you were pretty much at their mercy and then you you get the wavetable and you can scan through it, listening for sounds that are useful. And hopefully those will be next to other sounds that are useful in the same wavetable. And it's more the mode of exploration and finding cool things in a chaotic environment rather than what I would prefer to do for MPE sound, which is to deliberately and intentionally create exactly the sound that I want. And there's a particular kind of sound wavetables are known for. You have these weird alien harmonics, smooth crystalline structures, shimmery, richly textured evolving pads. And that stuff is all great. But I think to really unlock the full potential of the technique, you need to be able to make your own wavetables. And that's the first thing that technology has allowed us to do more recently. And the second technological innovation that really brings out the best wavetables. So the original wavetable synth might have had a wavetable built out of samples of an acoustic instrument, like say a saxophone. I don't know if they did or not. I was two years old, but they could have. And then you could build, put that in the wavetable, play it on the synthesizer, and it would be something like this. Because you're playing it on a keyboard, or as Roger Lynn calls it, a series of on-off switches, it's kind of lacking something in the sexy expressiveness of a saxophone department. So that second big technological innovation, of course, is MPE itself, because now we can use our instruments to impart some life and some breath into these waves and really get a nice, expressive, natural sound. This is part of my MPE sound design for Surge XT series. So Surge will be our primary synth, but as awesome as Surge is, it doesn't give us the ability to make wavetables. So we'll be using a couple other pieces of software to help us get that done. First, we'll need a wave editor. I'm going to use Audacity, uh, but any wave editor will do probably. We just need to get a sample, slice the sample, stitch some samples together. And then we need something that will export the wave that we make into the proper wavetable format that Surge can read. So for that, we'll be using Vital, which is another free synth. And finally, just to demonstrate some concepts, I'll be using Serum. And that's really just to visualize things. Uh, you don't need Serum to make the sounds that we'll be talking about today. So let's take a look at a wavetable. 
And then here in Serum with a custom made wavetable. And let me just show you what each of the parts of these is. This here is a single cycle wave or just a wave. And down here we have a collection of these single cycle waves. And the collection is referred to as the wavetable. And the way the wave works, as far as the computer is concerned, this is just a list of numbers. A number of samples running across the x-axis here. And each of these samples is going to have a value from negative 1 to 1. And that's your wave. And what the synthesizer is going to do is just loop that wave which will give you a tone. And the wave table stores multiple waves. And each of these is going to sound different. Now let me leave this oscillator view. And here we have a nice three-dimensional presentation of the wave table. And we have this parameter wave table position. And this parameter has a different name in every synth you use, it seems. Uh, the Access Virus calls this index. Serum calls it position. Vital, I think, calls it frame. And Surge calls it morph. So I'm going to try to stick to Surge terminology, and I'll call that morph. And as you change the value of morph, you're going to be selecting different waves here. So let's see how that sounds. And a typical way to do this is to add an LFO or some modulation to the wavetable to the morph so that it will sweep it automatically. And you can use that to audition your wavetable and see how it's going to sound in each of its states. Now we're hearing each waveform discreetly. So it's really a collection of waveforms. But we can also add morph tables to it. And you don't have to do this in Surge. That'll just happen automatically. But what it's done now is it's interpolated between each of those waveforms. And that will give us a smooth transformation. So let's give ourselves a firmer theoretical grounding here and take a closer look at one of these single cycle waves. Uh, this is a sample of my own voice. I'm sure you can hear the resemblance. So I wanted to make a physics metaphor, and I was going to say that the single cycle wave is the fundamental particle of wavetable synthesis, but that's not really true. The single cycle wave is kind of the atom, and the, fundament the fundamental particles are sine waves. And we have a different view up here, which is the same information that's contained in this view. And we can see it will change shape as I adjust this thing too. So this is a list of our sine waves that make up this sound. And they're in the harmonic series. So over here on the left, we have the fundamental. And then two times the fundamental, three times, four times, etc. And so all these sine waves come together to make our atom. So we can think of the fundamental as the nucleus. And each of these overtones as an electron. But the thing I like about this metaphor is that each of these overtones is quantized, just like as we all remember from fifth grade physics. An electron can be one in one orbit or another, but it can never be in between them. 
it's quantized. And the same is true of our overtones in a wavetable. The process of looping the waveform is going to cut off and quantize any overtone that is not an integer multiple of the fundamental. And what this means is our wavetable can have no inharmonic tones. So no noise, no clangy belliness. We can still use frequency modulation and other, and other typical synthesizer tools to create those tones. But in the wavetable itself, it's only going to be harmonics. As a demonstration of that, we're just going to draw some noise. And what happens to noise when you turn it into a wavetable is something like this. It has kind of a harpsichord kind of tone. Let me go back to this wave. So making this wave was pretty easy. I just recorded myself going, opened it up in Audacity, identify the repeating pattern, chop it out, and that becomes my single cycle wave. Now what happens when we do that is essentially that we're removing time from the equation to the extent that is possible when dealing with sound. So we have, there are no fluctuations over time, there are no competing inharmonious signals. All our sine waves are integer multiples of the fundamental, and we get a tone like this. Which as you can hear is very, very beautiful. It doesn't change at all in the slightest ever. And it can just ring for eternity. And it's beautiful. It's like the voice of an angel. But Max, you might say, you're missing the entire point of music. Change over time is what makes sound interesting and not just like a drill boring into your skull. And okay, you have a fair point. That's why it's good that we can use multiple waves in our wavetable. So we have multiple atoms and can build a molecule and then stuff out of that molecule. So I'm gonna import a second wave Now, if we go back to our 3D view, we can see our wave changing shape over time. And rather than use the LFO, I can control this. Let's say MPE timbre. And now we can have our wave changing its shape over time. Still not super impressive, but we'll get, it'll get better later. And you might ask, why did you slice out that little cycle? Why didn't you just use the whole sample? Then you'd already have the interesting fluctuations in sound there. And that's true. And there are times when it is more appropriate to use samples in production than a sampled wavetable. But by removing the fluctuations in the sound over time, what you do is you give control of those aspects of the sound to the performer, which is very desirable in the context of MIDI polyphonic expression. So that's why it's usually preferable, at least in an MPE setting, to use a wavetable or other synthesizer rather than a sample of sound. Not always, but usually. There are other issues with samples as well, in that mainly they're going to sound kind of weird if you bend them too far. They'll get chip bunky or Darth vader -y. And that doesn't really happen with our wavetables. So that should be a good foundation. Now I'd like to show you a couple ways that I 
use these wavetables in Surge. So here we have the Linstrument MPE Winds Doduk, and it is made up of two different single cycle waveforms. So my point A is here and I'm playing, I sampled the Duduk blowing as gently as I could while still getting a sound out of the damn thing. And up here at this end we have, I was just blasting it as hard as I could and then I had to take a few minutes to wait for the oxygen to return to my brain. And the wavetable does a really nice job of modeling both these sounds and the uh, and everything in between. So let's listen to it. I'm modulating the morph using pressure and timbre. I've got some filters on this sound. Let me turn those off for a second. You can hear it's a lot buzzier now. And those are harmonics that are not really in the duduk sound. Uh, what's happening is there's a lot of noise that happens when you play the duduk. And when we convert to a single cycle wave, those get harmonically aliased, I think is what Surge Ma Surge's manual calls it. But like when we looked at that white noise in Serum earlier and how it turned into a harpsichord kind of thing, that's what's going on here. The noise is being quantized and becoming harmonics. And because that's not really realistic with the Duduk sound, I'm filtering those harmonics out. Now, I don't always filter those harmonics out because they don't really sound bad. It, de it depends on the sound, but uh, what they can do is they can add a crispness to an otherwise dull sound, and that might be what you want some of the time. But I am filtering them here in the synthesizer rather than in the wavetable itself, because I, I want to preserve the wavetable as non-destructively as I can. Now, while we're here, let's notice that we do have some other options in Surge as to how to manipulate these wavetables. Let me go to the this view and we have saturation, just cranking the volume on it. We have this skew which tips it one way or the other. Format will squish it kind of like a pulse width. And the horizontal skew will squish it this way. I don't use those features a lot with wavetables, but they are an additional, if you feel like having a point A and point B on your wavetable is insufficient dimensionality to your sound, you can also modulate these guys. And that can be fun. So that being said, what would be another way that I could get more dimensionality to the sound, more depth and variety? That's better. So this one is made out of both a duduk and a saxophone. 
so it's a hybrid. So I have two wavetables here. The first one is the saxophone. And again, I played it softly and then I played it loud. So that's how I got my two points. And the first one, I think this is a different deduct sample, but again, it's a deduct played softly and then loud. And what I do then is I, I'm using the pressure curve to modulate the pressure for each of these, but then I'm using the timbre curve to crossfade between them using the mixer. So I'll bring this one up 12 decibels while it brings this one down 11 decibels. And so this way I sort of have four base waveforms arranged two-dimensionally. And this adds even more depth to your sound. And you can hear now we're a long way from that keyboard saxophone I played earlier. But I do want to say something more about these harmonics. Uh, as discussed in an earlier video about the alias oscillator, the relative proportions of these harmonics kind of constitute the identity of a sound. So hearing the differences between these harmonics helps us distinguish an oboe from a flute, from a bassoon, from a saxophone, from a kazoo. And so while this kind of harmonic fingerprint is not the only thing that gives a sound its identity, it is one of the hardest things to synthesize using traditional methods. We don't have any really good tools to shape these harmonics in a precise way. We kind of have blunt instruments. So if we take a sawtooth wave through a low pass filter, we can get a pretty good generic brass sound. But with a wavetable where we can specify these harmonics exactly, we can get a French horn as opposed to an English horn and more than that, we can get a particular French horn and a particular French horn played by a particular performer. And while our synthesized sound is not going to be an exact replica of the source of the wavetables, this is a way of getting more variety and specificity and individuality in our sounds. So in a nutshell, that's why I like wavetables so much. All right, now let's go and make a wavetable. I'm here in Audacity with a sample I took of my new Duduk. What I'm looking for in these samples is my point A and my point B. I want to slice two waves out of this recording and use them as the basis for my wavetable. And this bit's gonna do, I think. So I'm gonna slice off this much and put it in a new file. Paste it in, and zoom way in. That sounds good. And to get the single cycle, what I'm looking for is the zero crossings. 
and to keep my phase consistent, I'm always going to use the, uh, the positive portion of the wave as the beginning and the negative portion as the end. I'm going to do my best to copy at zero crossings. This one's pretty easy. Sometimes these zero crossings get a little confusing. So I'm going to copy that and paste it into a new file. And I'm going to normalize it to get it as loud as it can be. So here I have a wave, but to put it into a wave table, I need to have it be a certain length. At least that's the case when I'm working with Vital. So I'm going to go to my effects and I'm going to stretch this. And to stretch it in Audacity, you use the effect change speed. And here it tells me that I've selected 129 samples and I can type in a new length down here. And I'm going to go with 2048. So a couple things to know about this number of samples. This is the resolution of your wave. And a higher number here is going to mean more detail, more of the higher harmonics. And people will tell you when you're making wavetables with sampling that you want to sample the note F sharp zero. And that's because at a sample rate of 44K, F sharp zero has a wavelength of 2048 samples. So that's going to be the highest resolution that you can do in Serum. So if your source is a synthesizer or some really deep instrument like a, I don't know, a tuba, if you can, you should go ahead and sample at F sharp zero. And that will give you the best possible rep representation of all the harmonics in your sound. But I'm playing my deduck here. And to get an F sharp zero, it would have to be, I don't know, eight feet long. And my arms would need to be eight feet long so I can finger the holes. It's just not practical. And it turns out that this 129 samples that I got is really going to be fine. Any note with a pitch higher than the one I sampled is going to have all of its harmonics represented. And as I go lower and lower than the note I sampled, it will lose harmonics and it will become a bit more dull. And most of the time I find this is really not a problem. So here's my saxophone and duck that were sampled at around 129 samples. For most purposes, that's going to be plenty of detail. But if that's not enough detail for you, we can invent detail. If we mix in some noise after we've stretched this down to 2048 samples, we could add in a tiny bit of noise and it would add that crispiness that we've talked about earlier. Uh, another option would be to add some distortion and let it create the harmonics that it's going to create. So you do have options there, but in those cases, you're going to be manufacturing harmonics that are not really there in the original sound. And I find most often is just not necessary. So I stretch this to 2048 samples, zoom out, and there I have my first wave for my wavetable. Let's go back to the original file. And now I want to slice out a louder and brighter wave. I'm going to try to get the maximum contrast that I can. So yeah, that little bit at the end there is probably going to do it. Zoom in. So I start seeing the individual cycles. I'll copy this one. create another new file. 
and paste my second wave. Normalize it. And again, I'm going to slice off the ends that are on either end of the zero crossings. Sometimes you will get zero crossings in the middle of your wave. So you just have to learn how to recognize the whole pattern and not just assume that you're restarting it because you're crossing zero. That looks good. So I'm going to stretch this. Go with 2048 again. Okay, it's stretched. I'm going to copy it. Go back to the other window where I had the first wave. Put my cursor at the end and paste. Now someone's out there saying, but Max, I don't have a duduk or a saxophone or an ocarina or an eru or a cello or a French horn or a tuba. I have six kids and a mortgage. I can't afford to waste all my money accumulating instruments that I can't play the way that you do. Fair enough. Do you have a voice? Can you make multiple sounds with your mouth? But Max, I'm a terrible singer. My voice is gravelly and nasal and weak and annoying. I know. I've been there. I know what it's like. But we're looking for a single cycle wave here. Right? Not much. You don't have to be Freddie Mercury to hold a tune for one one hundredth of a second. So you can really use anything around you. I would say that anything that makes a tone, but the tone is not even necessary. The wavetable process will loop the sample for you anyways, so it doesn't have to be a, uh, a tonal sound that you use. And it can be a lot of fun to experiment with all kinds of different things. Uh, but if you're looking for a specific instrument, any halfway decent sample library, many of which are free or included in your digital audio workstation, any of those can be sliced up into perfectly usable wavetables. So these two waves here could be my wavetable, and they will be. If you wanted more, you could just repeat the process and keep adding different waves to the end. Now, the reason I like to stick to just two waves in my wavetables is to avoid any discontinuities. Because if I have, if I have, say, one particular harmonic in my first wave, that harmonic's at, say, 1%, and then in my second wave, it's at 20%, and then in my third wave, it's back down to 1%. That's going to create like a little bump in the wavetable that is just going to sound really weird if I control it with an MPE axis as I intend to. So the easiest way to dis to avoid those discontinuities is to just use two waves. And then you'll morph between those two waves and there will be no discontinuities. I will sometimes, like I might have a guitar sound and I want to have that harmonic in there at the end. I might add that in over here. And I would avoid the content, this continuity by telling Surge that my, uh, I would only let the Z axis modulate the morph by 60%. So I could never, I could never get to this region just with the, uh, Z axis alone. But then I would add a velocity modulation that could take me the rest of the way only if I struck at like the maximum velocity. So that way I can get my nice continuous guitar sound for most of the song. And then when I want those harmonics, I can just slap really hard and there they are. So that's one use case for more than two, for more than two waves in a table. There are certainly others. Like if you're not using MPE and you're controlling this with LFOs, it can be really cool to have one of these evolving pads that goes through. 16 different wave shapes 
and you can kind of create a whole composition that way. And the discontinuities are fine. They're part of the music. They're just disruptive when you're controlling them with expression. Now, in theory, the more waves you have in your table, the more accurate a model you're giving the synthesizer. So if I could produce 16 continuous levels of pressure on my Duduk, that would be the best way to do it. But I don't have the skill to do that, and there's going to be discontinuities, and the computer's going to do a better job. Uh, but there's another case if I'm using a synthesizer. So I'm very fond of my Pittsburgh Modular synthesizers, and I wish that they were polyphonic. And also I wish I could take them with me to the coffee shop on my laptop. So I'm in a, a long-term project of recreating this synthesizer with wavetables. I guess I used 32 in here. 32 is more than I would know. No, I went nuts. I would use 64. Okay. So I sampled my modular. I have the original Pittsburgh oscillator going through the original Pittsburgh filter. And I'm just doing a stepped filter sweep. It's stepped so that the filter doesn't change during each cycle. But I sampled 64 steps of this filter sweep, apparently kind of overkill. More recently, I've been using 16 steps. And what that will do is that will give you a very accurate model of the behavior of the filter. And this does really sound very much like my oscillator and filter combo. There are limitations to this technique, but it does work really well. If you had a vintage synthesizer on its last legs whose sound you wanted to preserve, Mephistopheles is coming to collect your GX1 that you had because you were in Led Zeppelin. You can make a pretty good model of the sound in this way. But there's going to be no discontinuity in here because this is all run by a machine. So I'm going to go back to Audacity. Our wave is ready. I'm going to export this as a wave. Now it's still just a wave. It's not a wavetable yet. To be a wavetable, it needs a certain set of headers in the wave file that will tell it that it is a wavetable and what its window length is. There might be other terms for window length. But that's going to be that number that we wanted to remember from earlier, that 2048, or whatever number we chose. Because we're going to bring this into Vital. Vital is going to need that number. And then Vital will write us our WAV file with that number embedded in the header. So let's go do that. OK, so here we are in Vital. And I'm not going to go into a big overview about Vital. I actually, I know very little about it. I just know it's going to do this one job for us. So this is my first oscillator. I'm going to click this pencil here. And here it gives us our waveform view. These are our harmonics. These are the phases of the harmonics, which I've not really talked about. That's just how each of these sine waves is aligned in time. And let's see if we can bring in our wave. So I'm going to go import wavetable. Duduk2 was the one. OK, and here's my wave. See it's sort of clipping at the top of the bottom a little bit. If I click normalize wavetable down here, I can make it fit more nicely into the window. That's important. You don't want the wavetable to be clipping, because that's going to add all kinds of harmonics that are just not supposed to be there. And Vital has this concept of keyframes that are down here in this timeline. And we've got two of them, I guess. So we have our start point and our end point. Can I? I can right click and create a keyframe if I wanted to. But I don't. I just want to go between these two. So this is my first keyframe, and this is the first half of my wave. This is what I'm expecting to see. 
it already knows my window size is 2048. I guess that's a default and it can guess that easily, but you would adjust this if you brought in a different, a different size wavetable. And its position is zero, that's saying that it's starting at the very beginning of the file. So I have the second keyframe over here. And look, oh, it did this very nicely. That position should probably be 2049 rather than 2050. But the window size is right, and it's giving me a nice morph. So this guy is good to go. I'm going to export to wave file. And let me just call this Duck 2 for surge. Now if I go back to surge, load up an initial patch. Change this to the wavetable oscillator. And load deduct 2 for surge. So now this is our wavetable and it's here in surge, which is where we want it. And I am going to modulate the morph with my timbre curve. It looks like my wavetable has been clipped here, but it doesn't sound like it. We would be hearing some sharper distortion buzziness down here in this part of the wavetable if it was really clipped. And if I go and look at this wavetable in Audacity, we'll see it's no longer just two waves it has created all these interpolations for us. And it doesn't appear to be clipping. I've still got a little bit of headroom there. So I'm guessing this is just an issue with how Surge is displaying this. And if I turn out my filter cutoff, we can hear more of the contrast between the two waves at either end. Now let's check out our low end since we had about 129 samples in our original waves rather than the recommended 2048. So yeah, we could make that crisper, but I think for, for most cases, that's going to be a sufficiently well-defined low end. And there you have it. That's how you make a wavetable for Surge. Thank you for joining me on this journey into the wild and wonderful world of wavetables. Bye.